Thank you very much for staying with us here at midweek. We've had some technical difficulties, but we've worked through them and we appreciate you staying here with us. We've got a critically acclaimed author, DJ Eagle Bear Vanis, who is a motivational storyteller and whose expertise in leadership and personal development. He is also the author of the celebrated book, The Tiny Warrior, A Path to Personal Discovery and Achievement, which is printed in six countries. His latest book, Spirit on the Run, is his first novel. DJ is a tribally enrolled member of the Ottawa Nation and a former military officer. He shows organizations how to practically apply the power of the warrior spirit to perform at their best, stay resilient, and thrive in tough, changing environments. For 20 years, he's developed his dynamic programs in 49 states and overseas to over 7,000 audiences, including Walt Disney, NASA, Intel Corporation, and hundreds of tribal governments, communities, and schools. He's also been invited to speak at the White House twice. He holds a BS from the Air Force Academy. He might even have been recruited by my wife, who was in charge of recruiting for the Air Force Academy, and an MS from the University of Southern California, and has served on the board of directors of the National Board of Certified Counselors. After serving 10 years as an Air Force officer, he is now the president of his own company, Native Discovery Inc. DJ's mission is to build the warriors of tomorrow today. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I would just like to first uh, say Buju Anishinaabedoj, Waganaksenko Dawa, DJ Vanis Nadejinakas, Muskegon, Michigan, Njibayan, San Diego, California, and Dojiba. Chimigwech. Uh, in my language, I said, hello, my fellow human beings. My tribe is Ottawa. My name is DJ Vanis, and I'm from Muskegon, Michigan, but I currently live in San Diego, California. And thank you very much for having me for MedWeek. I'm really excited to be here, especially with everything that has been happening in the last six months has been a challenging time for anybody that's in any level of business. And uh, this is my first, um, the first business I ever had was when I was seven years old. Um, entrepreneurship, you know, when we talk about the definition of it is find a need and fill it. Uh, my dad was stationed at Ellsworth Air Force Base, South Dakota. It was the middle of the summer. There was construction workers on every roof, re-roofing all the housing, and they were hot and sweaty, and I saw a need. And I went home, and I got a jug, and I got some Kool-Aid, and I mixed it up with ice water, and I got my little red rag wagon and went out there with Dixie cups and sold Kool-Aid. I went back, I got a couple of my friends, and the business grew. Uh, that was my first foray into business, but the, the business I have now, the, my company, Native Discovery, we started in 1999. And uh, so we've been through the ups and downs of the last uh, 20 plus years, but I know the last, this last roller coaster ride has been a doozy. And I know this tends to feel like being part of a suspense movie that nobody wanted to be a part of. Uh, with all the elements of a suspense movie, the, the, the tension and the anxiety and the aha gotcha moments and the worry about the road ahead. And that's the reality that we're in right now. That's the landscape that we're in right now. And I know it can be tough. I know it can be stressful. Uh, but what I want to do during the time that we have is help you navigate that with more clarity because the title of this program is Calling All Warriors. This is people who are willing to stand up and fight the good fight uh, in what you do in your business and what you do for your teams and clients and customers. Um, and we want to thrive through adversity. We don't just want to survive. We don't just want to hang on by our fingertips. We want to have the ability to thrive. And so we're going to unpack those ideas and discuss those during the time that we have, because I'm in the same boat with you. Um, this is a time right now where the pressure and the turbulence that we go through reveals gaps uh, in our systems, sometimes in our leadership, sometimes in, in our own habits and practices. And now is a great time to really be aware, take ourselves off of autopilot and really be aware of the road ahead and how we want to operate. We didn't choose to go through this pandemic, um, but we can choose how we go through it and who we are as we go through it. That's on us. That's our power. 
And I want to bring us back to that place of clarity and power in what we do. Um, I'm originally from Muskegon, Michigan. I'm a traveling world member of the Ottawa Nation. Now, the way that we got our name is ridiculous, and I want to share it with you. First and foremost, I want to set the record straight. Ottawa, Canada, they got their name from us. I want to, I want to correct the record on that. But the way that we got our name was kind of silly, and I want to share it with you. Uh, my people were from Michigan all the way down into the Ohio River Valley, all the way up into Canada. So we're on both sides of the border. And we had a vibrant trade industry set up with all the European nations that had made it across the Atlantic at that point and all the tribes in the area. And it was a vibrant, successful trade industry. And in the early 1600s, the French came and discovered us. Yeah, that was, that was a joke. You know they didn't discover us. Uh, we were already there do, doing our thing. And they ran into us. And they were impressed at what they saw. Uh, and they were a little bit jealous. Typical French. I always picture how this went down. Big floppy hat, peacock feathers, white tights, buckle shoes. I don't know that they were wearing that, but that's the movie I play in my mind. And they came up to our people and they asked a simple question. They said, excuse me, please, come, come. Um, who are you? Well, we didn't speak French. They didn't speak our language. So we totally blew the question. We thought they asked, what are you doing? So we answered. And we said, Odawa, which in our language means to trade. And the French said, Sacre bleu, you'll be Odawa. And they wrote it down. We're like, no, too late. The ink dried, history books printed us that way. We've been known for that ever since. And I think, what a goofy way to get named as a people. The first thing they catch you doing, God forbid, you're known for that for all time. And I stopped complaining because I think, wow, that could have gone a lot worse. Could have come across us while we're in the bushes. 400 years later, you go to a big native gathering, Denver March powwow, gathering of nations, and you start having conversations. What tribe are you? Kiowa. What tribe are you? Lakota. What tribe are you? PP tribe. I don't want to talk about it. Could have gone a lot worse. But I know that my people were the original successful business owners and operators in the state of Michigan. We actually, call, by the way, call ourselves Anishinaabe, which means the people. But that was a goofy way that we got our name. And I've, so for me to own and operate my own company, as I have for many years now, doesn't feel like a stretch out of my culture. I feel like I'm honoring it. And I bring that up because a lot of the ideas that we're going to cover in this program come from that place that place of the fundamentals, the basics, traditional wisdom and lessons from nature. Because frankly, all the principles that I'm gonna share with you, they have been proven in the worst of times. My people have been in business for hundreds of years. So think about how many ups and downs they went through. Um, so this is the last you know, speed bump in that journey uh, that we're all in together right now. But these ideas have been proven uh, to keep us strong, to keep us sustainable and to keep us moving, most importantly, in the right direction, which is forward. Not looking back, not hiding in the shadows and waiting for all this to pass, but getting out there and making the things happen that we want to happen. Um, one of the ideas that we have in our culture, which is, goes back to our title, calling all warriors, is that of a warrior. Now, I want to explain what this term means because this isn't the Hollywood media twisted image of the word warrior. This isn't somebody who shoots a million bullets and smashes buildings and you know, shoots these brooding expressions at the camera. That's not the role that I want to talk about. When we talk about our warriors traditionally, that role has a very different meaning. My people, we call our warriors Ogichida. And that term has nothing to do with what we see on TV or in movies. Um, it's not what we read about in books. It's about using our creator given talent and ability and developing that over a lifetime so that we can be an asset or a benefit to the tribe that we served. And today, whether that tribe is your own family, your community, your business, your teams, your clients, your customers, we all have a tribe to serve. This was a role that wasn't about what we could get. It was about what we could do, what impact we could have. It was somebody who led by example, somebody who faced fear with courage, and somebody who, under whatever circumstance they were going through, refused to quit. That's where the warrior spirit comes into action. That, that can do, well, we're gonna figure this out type of spirit and attitude that we really, really need right now. So in this warrior role, by the way, it transcends age, it transcends race, it transcends gender, and it's there 
available for anyone willing to walk it. And right now, we need warriors in our businesses. And the good news is the business of warriors can make us warriors in business. I am convinced of that through and through. And the more I walk this journey, the more I realize that truth. Uh, there are some unpackable things there about resilience and about courage under fire and about teamwork and collaboration and, and self-care that are so critically important to the road that we're on right now. And it goes back to those traditional warrior principles in action um, and how we use them every day. Uh, the, what a warrior isn't uh, is bulletproof. Now I say that because we sometimes overly romanticize the warrior role. Uh, we put it as this bright, shiny, unattainable thing on top of a mountaintop, this person who is so courageous and needs no one and is not afraid of anything. And that's not true. Our warriors dealt with fear. They dealt with setbacks. They made mistakes. They cried. They experienced pain. They never fought alone. Remember that. We'll come back to that one. But they, they needed outside answers. They needed help. They needed encouragement, uh, just like we all do. So never forget that fact. Uh, being a warrior, being strong and being directed and refusing to quit is one thing, but refusing help, that's just crazy. So I, I just wanna set the record straight on that. We all need that. We're human beings and we need that support. But that warrior role is so critically important right now. And, and when we seek help uh, and when we accept help, it shows humility too, uh, so that we can actually admit to the world and those around us the awful truth. We don't know everything, and that's okay. Uh, because when our people see us finding answers, when the, our people find us being innovative, creative in different ways, seeking outside resources, guess what they're gonna do? They're gonna follow suit. Um, so that's why that, that one is so important. But remember, this isn't about doing this alone. I was taught traditionally that we're a lot more like bees and ants than we are like eagles. We need each other. And we're better when we're with each other, with the right group. We're stronger, we're smarter, we're more resilient. Um, we come up with answers much quicker when we're surrounded by the right people. So remember that we're social creatures by design. We are neurologically hardwired for connection. So embrace that. Don't resist against it. We don't have to do all this on our own, and we shouldn't. If you're walking the journey alone right now, especially, you're doing it wrong. Okay? We want to... We want to take advantage of the resources we have around us. Um, one of the critical things that we need to really adopt is a mindset, uh, especially right now uh, during this turbulence and, and things have changed so much and the landscape continues to change. And, and the mindset is that of tribal centric thinking. Now I wanna unpack this one really quickly. In the last 25 years of my life, I have worked with 496 tribal nations from the Arctic Circle of Alaska down to Florida and from Maine out to Hawaii. And everywhere I've gone, I've had conversations with elders and tribal members that those tribes learn to not survive, thrive in the areas they were. Whether it's up in Alaska where it's 40 below zero and 60 mile an hour winds and it's dark half of the year, whether it's down in Florida where the moment you build anything in those swamps, it starts to be eroded away because of the moisture. Uh, whether it's the Pueblo people in New Mexico who lived in a place that was really hot in the summer and really cold in the winter, yet they used the local mud in their backyard to create adobe and make these beautifully engineered multi-level apartment complexes that stayed warm in the winter and cool in the summer. Uh, or whether it was my people up in Michigan who used what was in our own backyard, uh, birch bark which grew on the birch trees, and, and we used that for shelters and containers, but also for the canoes that made us famous. Canoes that were fast, light, maneuverable, super strong, and had hulls only less than a quarter of an inch thick. A, an 18 foot long canoe could weigh as little as 35 pounds. I mean, they were engineering, moments of engineering brilliance. And so the point I'm trying to make is all those tribes, including mine, used what was in our own backyards to create what we wanted to see, what we had right now in us and around us. And when we start thinking that way, we start finding the resources that we need. Because how many times, be honest, how many times have we lamented about what we lack, about what we don't have access to, about what we missed out on, uh, about what we're waiting for that may or may not happen down the road? We waste so much time and energy doing that. 
What I ask you to do is think tribal centrically. What do you have access to right now in you and around you to create what you want to see? You know, sometimes we already have the ingredients that we need to do just that. I want to share a real quick story about a company you've probably heard of, IBM, Big Blue. Now, during the depression, all these companies were shuttering uh, their doors. Uh, they were closing, they were laying people off. But during the Great Depression, IBM under Watson started to actually grow. They added to their knowledge base. They added people. They found the right people and added them in. They knew how important those resources were going to be. And lo and behold, in 1935, the Social Security Act um, solicited a bid for a company to take care of the wages and the, and the re wage reporting for 26 million Americans. That was in 1935. There was one company in the country that could have fulfilled that contract. And guess who it was? Yep, IBM. So that's one of the things that we get to think about is use the resources that we have well, your time, your energy, your skill set, your experience, all the lessons you've learned, the people in your network, all the things that you've listened to that you've read, your education, your training, all of that comes to bear right now in the turbulent time that we're in. And when we use that stuff well, we thrive. If we don't use it well, it doesn't do us or anybody else any good. And like I said, sometimes we already have what we need. We just don't see it. That's why I'm asking you to shift your mindset. A couple of years ago, I was in Florida, uh, down in Jacksonville, and I was doing a program. And lo and behold, I ran out of toothpaste. Not a national crisis, definitely an inconvenience. So I went down to the gift shop and I asked the person working there, I said, do you have a gift shop I can get some toothpaste or have a place I can walk to? And uh, she said, no, we don't have anything like that. But I think I can help you out. And she started digging behind the desk and I thought she was finding like maybe a toiletry kit or something like that. And she found what she was looking for and she was so happy um, when she presented it. And she goes, ah, oh, there it is. Here you go, Mr. Vanis. Now I know when I do these programs in person, if you're more than 10 feet away, you can't see this as an actual tube of toothpaste built for a Barbie doll. And she didn't just give it to me, she presented it to me. It was like, oh, you know, I'm accepting it. I'm like, oh, man, is that tiny. And I gotta admit, this is not what I expected. This is on some level, not even what I wanted, but this is exactly what I needed. And that's the mental shift that we have to make during the times that we're in right now. Access your resources, take a clear eyed view of what you have right now in you and around you. And I think you're gonna be fairly surprised at all the good stuff you have to work with. Take the blinders off. Here's the, here's the truth. The, the reason why this is so critically important, not just now, but always in business. Here's the truth. You're never gonna have all you want. You're never gonna have all you want. You're never gonna have all the time, all the, all the budget, all the personnel, all the support. You're never gonna have all you want. But if you look at what you have creatively, if you approach it with a warrior spirit, a can do, let's figure this out type of attitude, you can find a lot of times you have what you need. And that's the transition that we have to make. And when we do that, everything changes. You know, when I first started my business, I started literally with a Kinko's business card and a sky pager kind of dates when I started the business. Um, but in 2008, when the economy tanked, guess what the first thing was to be cut from budgets? You guessed it, training, conferences, events. And all of a sudden my calendar started clearing out. And I remember walking around the office and I was asking the right question, but I was asking it in the wrong way because I was stressed, I had anxiety, but you can relate to that. And I was walking around the office with my head down and scratching my head and going, Okay, um, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? And then I started asking the question in a different way. I started asking, what can I do? What can I do? What do I have to work with right now? And I started looking around. I said, I've got this incredible network I've built over 10 years. I've got this phone. Why don't I use it? And I started calling up every person I ever worked with, I ever interacted with. It was one of the best years we ever had because of that. And it wasn't just asking for, for work, it was just reconnecting with folks. How many times does that slip away from us? Maybe it's time to reactivate those connections, to get back in touch with folks. So I'm just saying that when we think travel centrically, the doors start to open up.
Um, and we need to lead by example in that because right now we have an opportunity in our businesses to be the leaders that we would want to be led by. And it starts with us. Just like Gandhi said, be the change in the world. When we talk about great leadership right now, we have an opportunity to display that in what we do. And the most powerful form of leadership there is, that there ever has been, the only one that really works, is leadership by example. And as much as we all know that, we need to be aware of that now more than ever. Because we as leaders uh, in business, we are transmitters. We are dee, 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 dee. We are putting signals out in every direction. And that people are watching everything we do, what we say, how we act, how we interact. And they're picking up on the signal. Uh, even if they don't tell us to our face, they're watching what we do and they're picking up on the signal. They're picking up some information on uh, what we think about where we're at, what we think about the road ahead, uh, how we feel about our business, how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about the team based on our language, our behavior. So we need to be aware that leadership by example is a 360 degree type of thing. And the reason why that's so important is we wanna be in alignment with what we say and what we do. Because frankly, that, that's why leadership by example is the only model that works. Everything else is lip service. And I mean that sincerely. Because let me ask you this question. When you were a kid, does, did do as I say, not as I do work for you? Now, some of you that are probably watching this, you're like, oh yeah, it worked for me. I was a good kid. Yeah, for most of us, it didn't hold water. It wasn't credible. Do as I say, not as I do. We just, it doesn't pass the litmus test. I remember being 14 years old, I was doing the yard with my dad. My dad was stationed at Keesler Air Force Base, Mississippi in Biloxi, Mississippi on the coast. Smoking hot, high humidity. We were both soaked with sweat. We were raking pine needles up on the, on the front yard and we took a break. And I immediately went under the eaves of the, roof of the house to get into the shade. My dad stepped out into the brilliant hot sunshine and lit up a cool menthol cigarette. I have never seen a more joyous expression on a human being's face. He lit this thing up, took a long drag. <sighs> yeah. Mm. Mm -mm. DJ, don't ever smoke. It'll kill you. It's laughable, right? It doesn't hold water. There's a disconnect there, and we feel it, and we see it. So we want to make sure that we are putting out the example uh, that we want to see return to us, because it will. Like I said, we're transmitters. We're putting that out. It will come back to us. So be aware of that. We need to lead with our integrity, doing what we say we're gonna do, being honest. You know, our people don't need us to be perfect. You know, leadership by example sometimes has a false burden attached to it, and here's what it is, that we need to be flawless. And I don't think th there could be some, anything further from the truth. Um, perfection is not the goal. You know, we don't need to lead by perfect example. And, and frankly, I wouldn't wish that curse on you Anyway, even if you could achieve it, which you can't, because the moment you became perfect, you wouldn't connect to the people that you lead anymore. So the goal is not to be perfect. And by the way, I think that's also what gets more people than anything into ethical hot water when they're trying to be flawless and perfect. Your people don't need you to be perfect, but they do need you to be honest, letting them know where you're going, what it's going to look like when you get there, what the rules of engagement are, what the expectations are. They do need that, but it's not about setting a perfect example. It's setting an example that's worthy of respect and worthy of followership. That's our goal as a leader. Um, we want to create alignment. Like I said, it, one of the things that we really want to make sure that we are putting out there, that we are transmitting, is a core belief that says this. Success is always around the corner. If we keep fighting for it, if we know what it looks like, and we use our resources well. Success is always around the corner. And the reason why this is so critical in leadership is because I've worked with organizations and businesses that their leaders did not feel this way. They had an attitude that I'm, I'm sure you've seen at times that can be outright destructive. And the attitude is this. That's just how it is around here. This is as good as it gets. You know, we're doing all we can with what we've got. And the reason why that can be destructive is because the moment we start settling for second best in what we can do, third best doesn't look so bad either. Fourth best is all right. At least we're not as messed up as that other company. And it doesn't do us any good. So we want to have that core belief. Success is always around the corner. We have to fight for this, especially right now. 
You know, activate your warrior spirit. Use it every day. Um, it's a no quit type of attitude where we will figure this out in time uh, and together. And, and the other thing that's so important that we need to transmit is the right attitude right now. Because when we talk about being positive or optimistic, I, I want to share something with you that I, if I could foot stomp this loud enough, I'd shake the whole building down. And the idea is this, it is unfair and unrealistic to expect anything from someone else that we are not willing to show or share first. Does that make sense? We should never let, expect our people to have a good attitude if we don't. We shouldn't expect them to be hopeful if we're not, to be enthusiastic if we're not displaying that daily. You know, it starts with us. So we need to lead by example in that way. The other way we need to lead by example is in communication. Uh, right now, people aren't just hungry. They are absolutely desperate for optimistic, hopeful messages that are clear, concise, and consistent. People are desperate for that right now because there's so much anxiety and worry about the road ahead. You know, and when we talk about how important that is, I, I want to say something, you know, before we get too much, too deeper or uh, too far into this. Don't assume anything with your people. Don't assume anything. When we communicate, um, if you love your people or if you like them even a little bit, don't make them do what they're terrible at, which is to read your mind. And, and don't expect them or don't, you know, expect to be able to read theirs either. We don't want to assume anything right now. Check in on your people. Ask them how things are going. Ask them how their work is coming along. What, what's hanging them up, them up? Not just work-wise, but maybe some of the mental stuff, some of the stuff going on at home, uh, some of the stress is there. So we don't want to assume anything. We want to make sure that we're open with our communication and that we're making sure that our messages are optimistic and positive because that inspires hope. We want to make sure that our messages are clear because that inspires clarity. We want to make sure that our messages are concise. Uh, we don't want to say things in three paragraphs we could say in one. And the reason why con being concise with our messaging is so important is because it inspires focused attention, uh, which is so needed right now with everything that's going on. And the last one is to make sure we're communicating with consistency because consistency breeds trust. It breeds stability and it allows us to create momentum in what we're doing. So, and the, and the last thing we really wanna make sure we're leading by example with is care. How we care for our people, how we interact with them right now is more important than it ever has been because everybody at some level is emotionally compromised, just a little bit. And now is the time to give each other a little bit of grace, including ourselves uh, during this time of uh, turbulence that we're all in together. And one of the ways that we can do that is by showing people that we acknowledge their contribution, that we acknowledge their value in our team, in our business, what they do for us. Uh, I read a, a report, it was a survey done by the Trust Edge. They do a, a big survey with 5,000 people in business, all different levels of uh, development, including internationally. And out of those 5,000 that they surveyed, 36% said that they would leave their current organization for lack of recognition. Wow. Now, who's responsible for that? Us. You got it. So we want to make sure that we're aware that we are, we are acknowledging value, which is, by the way, the highest need we all have. You have it. I have it. My kids have it. Your kids have it. Your customers have it. Your teammates have it. It's the need to feel valued at some level that we have worth, that our, that our work has meaning. And we're able to share that with the people that we work with when we provide praise, earned praise. I've never been a believer in cheap praise. If you give somebody the authority to do something and they mess it up, that's not the time to go, way to go. It's not gonna make them feel any better and it's not gonna help you either. What I'm talking about is praise that people earn. You know, when people are working hard for you, acknowledge that. Uh, catch them doing the right thing. That's one of the things I think as leaders we really need to work on. Catch people doing the right thing and call them on it. Because when you do that, you acknowledge their value and their spirit shoots through the roof. If it happens with us, admit it, and it, it will happen with them too. Now, two things, now the thing about praise is, number one, it's free. You don't have to do paperwork for it. You don't have to add a budget line item. It's there for anybody willing to use it. Uh, but there's two things that stand in the way of people using this as much as they should. Number one, 
I, I hear leaders go, well, I don't want to tell my people they're uh, doing a great job for me all the time, but they know. Oh, I beg to differ. I'll go back to what I said before. If you love your people, if you like them even a little bit, don't ask them to do what we're terrible at, which is to read your mind. And the second one is I hear leaders say, well, I don't want to tell them they're doing a good job for me all the time because I don't want to spoil them. Okay, that one is just dumb. I've been doing this work for over 25 years, and I'll tell you what I've seen. I've never seen anybody get burned out or spoiled by praise that they actually earned. But I have seen a lot of people get burned out by feeling like they work within an organization where their value, their contribution is never acknowledged. I've seen that a lot. So that's on us as leaders. We need to, to be able to acknowledge that. Um, so how do we get through the change that we're in right now? How do we stay resilient on the path ahead? Uh, there is um, a, a toy that was way back in the day. I won't give you the dates, but some of you may be able to relate to this toy called a Weeble Wobble. I don't know if anybody remembers these little egg-shaped, you know, characters. And, they ha and I had all the Weeble Wobble swag. I had the treehouse, the airplane. And Weeble Wobbles had a little jingle, and it went like this. Weeble Wobbles, you can knock them over, but they don't fall down. They write themselves up. They, they had weight on the bottom, and that's how it worked. We need to be able to develop that same principle in how we operate in our businesses, especially right now. And it has to do with being able to navigate change more gracefully. I won't say gracefully, just more gracefully. Uh, because change right now is, is messing with people's minds and the way that we operate sometimes. The anxiety is sometimes getting the best of folks. So there's two mindsets we need to take with change that I, I think are really helpful. Number one, understand change is a constant. This is the one guarantee we have from now until we draw our last breath. There's no getting out of it. Uh, for instance, time, you know, that the, the, we can't stop the hands of time, though we try, right? I remember being a kid um, shopping with cereal with my mom, shopping for cereal with my mom. And we were in the store and, you know, see all the colorful characters. And when we're shopping for cereal, I didn't care about nutrition. I didn't even care what was in the box, except for the one thing that they did have that I was interested in, which was the toy that they used to put in a box of cereal. I, I couldn't have cared less what was in the box. Could have been cat kibble. I wanted the toy. And they had cool toys back then. Little uh, tattoos you could lick and stick on your sister's forehead or a little magnifying glass you could use to light the backyard on fire. Cool toys. Um, but once you hit 45 and beyond, what's the number one ingredient we're looking for in cereal? You guessed it, fiber. What a sad turn of events we go through on the journey as people. That's part of the deal though, change is a constant. The other thing to keep in, pers uh, keep in mind is to keep this in perspective, this too will pass, this too will change. And if we keep our perspective, we don't go into freak out mode, we just work the problems that are in front of us until we get through this, and we will. Uh, change drives us crazy because number one, we like to be comfortable, we do. Um, but nature teaches us that the more Something, you know, the more a natural creature is in their environment, the more comfortable they are, the more at risk they are. Uh, we grow through times like this. We can by being innovative, by being creative, by using those resources that we sometimes have discarded and we bring them back into the mix. We can grow through this time. I know it's not comfortable. I'm there with you. But uh, there was an experiment down in Tucson, Arizona called Biosphere 2, where they tried to replicate the Earth's environment inside of a building. It's a fascinating place to go. Uh, they have a desert area, a coastal region, a rainforest, and several others. And when they first started this experiment, they would grow trees that would only grow to a certain height, they wouldn't bear fruit, and then they'd fall over. And the scientists were kind of scratching their heads, what's going on here? You know, we, these are the good seeds, we're providing the right amount of light, the right amount of nutrition. And what they found was the trees were missing a vital element to their growth, which was wind. Because wind challenged the trees and would build what was called stress wood, which is that wood that really girds them up. It makes them resilient. It makes them strong. And we're all going through that process right now. So I, I know comfort, we like to be comfortable and change messes with our comfort, but take heart. This is where we grow as people and as, uh, and as uh, folks that are involved in business. This is an opportunity to do that. Um, resistance, there's resistance to change. 
even for the stuff that's good for us. I mean, think back to when we were kids, eat your vegetables, do your homework, stop poking your sister in the eye. We would resist change, especially if it felt forced. And a lot of the changes we're going through right now feel that way. But how, do you want to put your time and energy into resisting the changes we're in or putting that same time and energy into finding solutions so that you can do what you do even better? I think that second option is much better. I'm sure you'd agree. And the third reason why change messes with us is it triggers fear. So how do we actually handle the, the changes that we're in effectively so that we're getting good results in what we do, that we're thriving in this environment, not just surviving? The way that we do that is I, I call them the five stays. Number one, stay calm. Stay calm. Take a big breath with me. Just take a big breath and let it out. Make sure you let it out. I don't want anybody to pass out. Just doing that simple act lets the dirt settle in our mud puddle so that we can see clearly again. We can't operate well when we're in freak out mode. We're, we're good at fight or flight because that adrenaline starts kicking in, but we are not good at solving complex problems in those moments. We have to be calm to be able to do that. I'm sure a lot of you know the story behind Apollo 13, a real life incident. They made it a movie with the uh, always famous Kevin Bacon, but the, it was a real life incident where we almost lost three astronauts halfway between the earth and the moon. Not a good place to have a breakdown or technical difficulties. Now, uh, astronauts are trained to operate under, under high stress and the mission commander on the ground knew that if these astronauts started to panic, they were going to die. That's how high the stakes were. And so through the course of the conversation, he basically had the idea or the spirit of the conversation was, okay, gentlemen, I know what's wrong. We all know what's wrong, but let's focus on what's right. What do we have to work with? It was almost like a tribal centric way of thinking about the issue. What do you have available? Besides our brain power, our, our physical resources, the, the team at NASA on the ground, and they put something together. If you know the story, they put something together literally with cardboard rubber tubing and duct tape that would have put MacGyver or James Bond to shame and they got home safely. All because they were able to stay calm and work the problem. Uh, the second thing is to stay ph philosophical. I know that's a big ask right now. That's a, uh, I'm not asking you to do easy things. I'm asking you to do things that work. And what I mean by that is when we have a philosophy of change, we have a, a point of clarity. We have an anchoring point. Um, I love our philosophy and our tribal communities about change. We never looked at change as part of life because when you make something a part of, you can, you can shove it to the edges and curse it and fight it. We didn't look at change that way. We looked at change as life. It was fully integrated into everything. So it wasn't something we needed to curse or, or condemn or run away from. It was something to embrace. It was something that was part of the journey. So I love that. And, and in one of the philosophies I've carried for over 25 years, I stole from Lenin, not the one from Russia, the one from Liverpool, uh, who was a member of the Beatles who had a line in his song that said, there are no problems, only solutions. I love that because it's, it's elegant, it's simple, it's easy to remember, and it has helped me through some of the toughest times I've had in my life, in my business, in, in every aspect of the journey. So adopt something that gives you that type of clarity. Find a philosophy because there's always opportunity and change. Uh, that's the good news. If we look hard enough, we can always, always find it. So stay focused on that, stay philosophical about it. Uh, stay um, grounded. Right now, it's more important than ever to know what our values are, to know what's important to us. And I would ask you a question, through all this, the, the chaos of the pandemic, the economic impact, have your values changed? I'm gonna suspect for the vast majority, they haven't. Um, so some of us may have shifted our values because now we know going through this time what's really important and may have made a shift. But for most people, most people in business, our values have deepened going through this. And that's a good thing because when we are grounded in that, when we know what our values are, everything in life and business becomes clear. We know what to say yes to and we know what to say no to. And there's power and clarity in both. So it, it's a grounding effect. It gives us a, a safe piece of earth, even if there's storms raging all around us.
if we know what our values are. So stay grounded in yours now more than ever. The first step in every traditional ceremony across Indian country, before we step into a ceremony, we had to do something for ourselves and it was purify or cleanse. And we did that through a variety of ways, burn sage, sweet grass, we would fast or isolate, but it was always done for the same reason. And it was to get grounded again into what really counts, get reattached to that stuff, sweep all the other junk away, the stress, the anxiety, the doubt, the regret, whatever it may be, sweep all that away until we're back on solid ground. That's why it was always the first step of a ceremony. And that's why we would get so much out of those experiences. Can't do that if we're running around in clutter and we're not grounded to the things that really matter. Staying focused right now is critically important because if we focus on everything, we're actually focused on nothing. And the results speak for that. If you stood out on a day like today and it was sunny out and you stood out there for five minutes, what would happen to you? Probably nothing dramatic. Uh, we get warm, we might sweat a little bit. Even though there's a star only 93 million miles away from this place pumping an insane amount of energy, it's spread out. So it doesn't have a big effect in any one place. But if you take that energy that's falling gently on your face and you harness it, you focus it into say a magnifying glass, any 10 year old kid will tell you what you can do with that. This ex 10 year, year old kid used to do it all the time and I got busted for it. You can light your backyard on fire and it all comes down through the power of focus. Because if we don't do that, we're doing the worst thing a warrior can do in battle. We're dividing and conquering ourselves. We can't afford to do that right now. Stay focused on what's important, what matters, what your goals are, what your resources are that you have available in you and around you and start creating some solutions. And the last one is to stay flexible. Stay flexible. Right now, innovation, creativity count, uh, probably more than they have in a long time. Um, being able to put the pieces and the ingredients and the resources that we have together in new and creative ways to still get the good results that we wanna get. They, they always say uh, that, that quote that we've all heard, there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat. I don't know why people say that. It's a terrible quote, admittedly, but the takeaway there is if you wanted to skin a cat, there's more than one way to do it. And the takeaway there speaks to flexibility. We need that right now because as goals may remain the same, we have goals that we wanna hit. The tactics, the way that we get there, not only can change, but sometimes must change. And that's perfectly okay. That's part of adaptability and, and being flexible. We need, we need that right now. I have a story in um, my first book, The Tiny Warrior, that has one of those natural lessons that teaches us what water does when it comes to an obstacle. You know, when water comes down a mountain with all its fury and potential, and it runs into an obstacle, it doesn't just slam on the brakes and go back up, back up. It finds a way to flow. It goes around the obstacle. What if that doesn't work? It goes over it. What if that doesn't work? It goes under it. What if that doesn't work? It knocks it out of the way or it goes through it. Water finds a way to flow to its goal. And right now, we need to do the very same thing. And I'll end with how we started. I know this is a tough time right now. I know the landscape is ever changing. I know it can be stressful, but we didn't choose the situations that we're in right now. But we can choose as we walk this path forward, we can choose who we are and how we are. And right now as a leader in business, it's important that we are there first, because remember, we're transmitters, dee, 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 putting those signals out in every direction. This too shall pass, this too shall change, and we can grow through this so we're even better as we come through on the end. That's what thriving through adversity is all about. It's not hanging on by our fingertips, it's actually making things better because of the situation that we're in, leveraging what we have, leveraging this moment. So with that, I hope that gives you some strength. Tap into your warrior spirit, use these principles to navigate change more gracefully, to lead by example in every way, to make sure that you're on that warrior path of, of service. Uh, that's what it's all about in the end, having a, making a contribution, having an impact. And I'll look forward to seeing you down the road. Stay strong on your warrior path. Chi miigwech. Thank you very much.